Today in your Bibles, if you please find your way to the Gospel of Luke chapter 24. Verses 13 to 35, as we are looking in a series called The Gospel. Last week we looked at what is the gospel as we saw Jesus Christ dying on the cross for our sins, the fact that he was buried, and then he rose again the third day. That's the glorious gospel. And then today we're going to see the gospel explained by Jesus himself. In Luke chapter 24, some years ago, Dr. W.A. Criswell at the historic First Baptist Dallas, they just had, a, in fact, a, a, a matter of weeks ago, a fire of that historic church building. But amazing, the uh, truth is, they were able to spare the, many of the outside walls of that historic church building right in downtown Dallas. But it destroyed the inside of that historic sanctuary where Dr. W.A. Criswell, on a New Year's Eve service, preached a sermon that became known as the Scarlet Thread Redemption. And Dr. W.A. Criswell, that night, preached through the Bible, starting in the book of Genesis, and went all the way to the book of Revelation. So now when you think I have a long sermon, just remember W.A. Criswell went through the whole Bible. <laughs> a New Year's Eve service. I have a feeling it took some hours to do that. But what he did was showing Jesus Christ all the way through the scriptures. Do you realize today that you can find Jesus in every single book of the Bible? You really can. Some might say, well, wait a second, in Esther, God's name is not mentioned. But you can say about Mordecai's courage. And also, the very fact, remember what Mordecai had said to Queen Esther to go and approach the king. And she says, the king has not called for me for this month. And if I go in and if he does not extend what? That scepter. But you know what? When Esther, Queen Esther went in, what did the king do? Extended that scepter. Now we think about that in the book of Hebrews because of the work of Jesus Christ. Well, what do we have access to? His throne room to find mercy and grace in time of need. Friend, you see Jesus throughout the scriptures. The scarlet thread of redemption. I agree with Dr. W.A. Criswell wholeheartedly. You find that throughout. Even in the book of Judges, as we see what Rahab, or in, in Joshua actually, Rahab putting out that scarlet cord. She believed and feared God and was spared in the destruction of Jericho because she had faith in Almighty God. And when I see that cord, that scarlet cord that was hanging out, the scarlet thread of redemption, amen? So we're going to day to see these two travelers on the way to Emmaus, which is about seven miles away from Jerusalem. This is the afternoon of the resurrection day of Jesus. The women have went early to the tomb. They're looking for the body of Jesus, but the grave is empty, except the linen wrappings are all rolled up. The face cloth is rolled up separately. And when they go there, the stone has been rolled away, and there are, Luke records, there's the two angels that says, why are you looking for the living one among the dead? He's not here. He is risen just like he said. Now, Peter and John, when they hear from the women, they run to the tomb. John gets there first, and John looks down into the tomb and sees this. He has a glance. 
Peter keeps running. He runs right on into the tomb and he examines to see that such things. And Peter was pondering these things. Well, later on, you have these two disciples that are traveling or walking to Emmaus, that's seven miles. On your outline today, I have, I'm actually using, uh, I've adapted the main points and the sub points from an expository outline by Pastor Paul Chapel in his book, Luke, Journey with Jesus. Uh, I struggle coming up with the same letters for these points, and he did a good job on this outline, so I adapted this. The first of all is the confused travelers. And first of all, the confused travelers because of the failure to recognize Jesus. Let's begin reading in verse 13. And behold, two of them were going that very day to a village named Emmaus, which was about seven miles from Jerusalem. And they were talking with each other about all these things which had taken place. While they were talking and discussing, Jesus himself approached and began traveling with them. But here's a key in verse 16. But their eyes were prevented from recognizing him. So Jesus joins them. He is traveling with them, but they are prevented from seeing that this is Jesus. They are prevented. In verse 17, Jesus said to them, what are these words that you're exchanging with one another as you are walking? And they stood still, looking sad. Why are they standing still looking sad? They have received the report that the tomb is empty. They have heard all the things that the women, that, that the angels had said to the women. And the women gave the report, and they're walking. Later on, it's in the afternoon. They're on their way to Emmaus, and they're talking all about how Jesus was put to death and how he died on the cross, how he was buried. But are they believing in the glorious resurrection yet? No. They're in unbelief. Just like the Sadducees, when you don't believe in the resurrection, that's why you're sad, you see. <laughs> They were standing still, and what? They were looking sad. Where's the hope? We thought he was going to redeem Israel. So there's Jesus with them, but they failed to recognize it was him. But they're also confounded because of the death of Christ. The Bible says in verse 18, one of them named Cleopas answered and said to Jesus, are you the only one visiting Jerusalem and unaware of the things which have happened here in these days? Of course, they don't realize they're talking to Jesus. And so verse 19, Jesus' question is actually quite comical at this point because they don't know it's Jesus. And, Who's this all about? Jesus. But they are kept from recognizing him. So Jesus asked them and says, they're talking about these things that have happened. So verse 19, Jesus said to them, what things? What things? And they said to him, the things about Jesus the Nazarene, who was a prophet mighty in deed and word in the sight of God, and all the people. We have seen the wondrous miracles, the deeds done by Jesus. We have heard his teaching, the powerful words of the Lord. But they're wrong on something. They didn't go far enough. How are they seeing Jesus as a prophet? Now we have the threefold office that he is prophet, priest, and king. But they're seeing him as a prophet. They're not seeing him as the Savior, are they? As of yet, they, they, they're, they're still clouded on this. We understand that this is a prophet, a mighty prophet of God. 
You know, many people say this about Jesus. That's where they stop. They say Jesus as a mighty prophet of God. But they fail to see him as the Savior. There's many that live in our world. There are many that see Jesus as a prophet, but not the Son of God, not the Savior. So when Jesus said what things, notice verse 20, they continue how the chief priests and our rulers delivered him to the sentence of death and crucified him. The reason they were looking sad still was they knew that Jesus had died on the cross. And they were not thinking about the glorious good news of the resurrection. Jesus did die on the cross for our sins. But we must not leave Jesus on the cross because he was buried, but he rose again. I'll never forget this. In the summer of 1991, was working on a, uh, was on a work mission team in Guatemala. And went into a, a large cathedral in Guatemala City on this one day. Now, I, I have to tell you, friend, I really believe with all my heart what I saw and experienced was demonic. I saw all these people, the candles and kneeling, praying to these saints. But what got me was an artist's rendering of Jesus Christ in a coffin. And I left that cathedral. And the assistant leader came out and said, Brian, are you okay? And I said, yes, I had to get out of there. I said, somebody needs to tell him he's alive. He's a risen Savior. Jesus in the coffin? No, he's alive, a risen Savior. I don't believe I'll ever get over what I saw in that cathedral. The death of Christ in verse 21, here's the key. But we were hoping that it was he who was going to redeem Israel. What are they still thinking about? A political savior. We were hoping that it would be Jesus to deliver us from Rome. From the bondage to Rome. We had our hearts set that he would be the one. That's what Judas Iscariot had his heart set on. That he would be the political savior to save him from Rome. But when he talked about going to the cross and dying for our sins and being the suffering servant, that was completely foreign. Because that didn't fit the picture of the idea they had as a Messiah. The Savior. The political Savior. The loss of hope. Pastor Chapel wrote, many believe Jesus was a good teacher with some strong moral principles. Muslims believe Jesus was one of the greatest prophets, but Jesus is so much more than that. He is the Savior of all men, the mighty Son of God. I looked up this week, so this comes from Wikipedia, but I don't go off of Wikipedia alone, but some other things. Do you realize this is what most of the Muslims believe? Unlike the Christian view of the death of Jesus, most Muslims believe that Jesus was raised to heaven without being put on the cross. They don't believe it was Jesus who died on the cross. And God created a resemblance to appear exactly like Jesus who was crucified instead of Jesus. And he ascended bodily to heaven 
there to remain until a second coming in the end days. Another noted, most Muslims believe that Jesus was not crucified, but that someone who looked like him was crucified in his place. This is often called the substitution theory. The theory states that the Jews intended to crucify Jesus, but Allah made it appear that someone else was crucified in his place. According to the theory, God only changed the man's face, not his body, so people were confused about who was killed. But Jesus died for our sins, according to the scriptures. By the way, a personal relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ is something completely foreign to Muslims. The idea of a relationship with God. But God wants us to know him in that personal way, that intimate way. They had lost their hope. They're able to tell Jesus, though, about the testimony of the women, verses 22 to 24. But also some women among us amazed us when they were at the tomb early in the morning and did not find his body. They came saying that he had also seen a vision. They had also seen a vision of angels who said that he was alive. Some of those who were with us went to the tomb and found it just exactly as the women also had said, but him they did not see. But they're still looking sad because they haven't come to the point to believe that Jesus rose from the grave. His grave is empty, but we don't know what's happened to him. But they weren't thinking he's alive. He is risen. He is the living one. Point two, the clarification of Christ. Can you imagine being taught by Jesus himself? Wow. <laughs> this conversation, the teaching of what Jesus does with these two that are walking on their way to Emmaus, that are hopeless. Verse 25, Jesus said to them, O foolish men and slow of heart to believe in all that the prophets have spoken. They know in their head the reports. They just told Jesus what they had been told from the women. And even some of the disciples and Peter and John's report of what happened when they went to the tomb. But they're still unbelieving. This is an important point. People can know some things with their head. We can call it head knowledge. But as my good friend Bob Carter used to say, it has to have the 18 inch drop from the head to the heart. See how much in the New Testament you have the heart? What did Paul say? That if you believe in your heart, that God has raised him from the dead, that you'll be saved. With the heart one believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession unto salvation. The heart, the center of man. They were sad because they had heard all this information, but they were not believing in their heart that Jesus Christ was alive, that he was risen. But he said to believe in all that the prophets have spoken. The companionship here of, or the concerning the prophecies. Wearsby noted in his commentary, their real problem was not in their heads, but in their hearts. They could have discussed the subject for days and never arrived at a satisfactory answer. A friend of mine that was a longtime pastor used to make appointments with the religion faculty at Neria College. And he challenged them and he says, you know, in every area of study, the professors believe the textbook. And he asked one of the religion professors and said, what's your main textbook? His answer was the Bible. 
My friend challenged him and said, do you realize you're the only one, the only area that doesn't believe your textbook? Said, you are teaching nothing but the areas of why not to believe the Bible. <laughs> teaching that the Bible has all sorts of errors, is not inspired, is not inspi the inspired word of God. And you know what he would do? He would witness to these professors. Because they had head knowledge. But many of them didn't believe the Lord Jesus Christ. Remember Jesus saying to the religious leaders of his day, you have the scriptures, you read and study the scriptures, and in them you think that you have life, but those scriptures are speaking of me. And you would not believe. Friend, there's a lot of people that have a lot of knowledge about the Bible that's going to spend eternity in hell because they will not believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. Have you ever witnessed to somebody that knew a lot about the scriptures? And boy, they would try to get you off onto all sorts of various tangents. And it's tough to try to keep on the main thing, talking about Jesus and their need to know Jesus Christ. I found out one, one of the things that was helpful was to write a letter. And in that letter, present Jesus Christ. Was it the Romans road or, or some area of, of explaining point by point the good news of Jesus and what he came to do, the plan of salvation. And don't just put the scripture references for them to look it up, but write out the scriptures in that letter. I did that with Lisa's grandfather years ago. I always said he knew enough about the Bible to be dangerous. Every time I would talk to him about the Lord, he would just try to get me off on all these tangents, all these areas. And as he was nearing death with cancer, I sat down and wrote a letter and the plan of salvation. He told it a, a free will Baptist pastor in the area in South Columbus. He pulled out the letter and said, yeah, I, I came to know Jesus. It wasn't about what I said, it was God's word. But his heart was opened to receive what he already had known for a number of years. But you see, it had dropped from the head to the heart. They know a lot of facts. They've told Jesus, but they're not believing. So verse 26, was it not necessary for the Christ to suffer these things and to enter into his glory? We think about Philippians 2, 8, and 9, the fact that Jesus Christ put on flesh. He emptied himself, not ceasing to be God, but he laid aside certain privileges of deity. Theologians know what is called the kenosis, the emptying, not emptying of deity. But he said he put on flesh, took the form of a man, and he was obedient to the point of death on the cross so that he has been exalted, that he has the name above all names, and that the name of Jesus every knee shall bow and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Jesus said, was it not necessary for the Christ to suffer these things and to enter into his glory? The place of Christ. Adrian Rogers said about this passage, what Jesus is doing now is putting their dependence not upon his physical presence, he's going to be leaving, but upon the word of God. We see the prophecies. But now we're going to see the, the comfort of the disciples, being in verse 28. I'm sorry, let's not skip. Verse 27 is very important. Beginning with Moses 
And with all the prophets, Jesus explained to them the things concerning himself in all of the scriptures. When Paul preached the gospel, what did he say? Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. What scriptures was Paul talking about? The Old Testament scriptures. Starting with Moses, Jesus went back. We're not told in the scripture, but I have a feeling that Jesus dealt with this verse. I imagine he tells these guys on the way to Emmaus, he goes back to Genesis 3.15. After Adam and Eve had sinned in the garden, sin has entered in, death has entered in. But the Bible says, I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your seed and her seed. He shall bruise you on the head. What did Jesus do at the cross? He gave a death blow to Satan. Satan was judged at the cross. He crushed Satan's head. But did Jesus suffer on the cross? Yeah. You bruised his heel. Jesus said all the way back in Genesis 3, all the way back, this is in the Word of God, in the Scriptures. Proto-Evangelium, the first announcement of the gospel. Genesis 3.15. Do you suppose he maybe talked to him about how Abraham was offering up his son Isaac? And when Abraham said, Jehovah Jireh, the Lord will provide. And as Abraham had the knife ready to slay his son, there was a voice that says, Stop. But at the cross at Calvary, there was no voice. There was no stop. Many years later, Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God, would die on the cross. Oh, you know, the tabernacle, these, these fellows would have been familiar with the Old Testament scriptures. And he would point out how those, that every item in the, the tabernacle and those animal uh, sacrifices were pointing forward to Jesus. It is coming. Oh, he probably talked with them about Exodus 12, the Passover, how the Lord delivered the children of Israel out of bondage in Egypt. What was put over the door? The blood of the Lamb. That all was a picture, wasn't it? Leviticus 16, the Day of Atonement, the high priest would have to go in with the blood to present for the people, the sins of the nation. You can keep going and go through the Old Testament books. And then you get into the Psalms. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Jesus quoting Psalm 22, 1. Jesus could tell them and say, just like it was said in the Psalms, how they would pluck his beard, how they would even cast lots for his clothing. All this prophesied in the scriptures. Can you imagine that Bible study? As Jesus explained the scriptures to them and said that was all pointing to what I came to do. But do they recognize him yet? No. Jesus is explaining the Old Testament scriptures that were pointing to him. And then he got to the prophets. Can you imagine Isaiah 53? I was wounded for their transgressions. I was crushed for their iniquities. All have like sheep turned away, each to his own way, and the Lord has laid on him the inequity of us all. That's why Jesus came, the suffering servant, to die on the cross. He's explaining to them the things concerning himself and all the scriptures. 
Some people today say, is there any value at all of reading the Old Testament, of studying the Old Testament? I've heard some say, oh, I only read the New Testament. Well, the Bible says preach the whole counsel of God. I believe in preaching and teaching the whole Bible. <laughs> Why? We have a privilege, don't we? We can open up the scriptures from Genesis to Revelation, the Word of God. But we can have that understanding. We can see in Genesis 22 as Abraham was offering up Isaac as a sacrifice. We can see the type or the picture of Jesus. We can read Isaiah 53 and say, wow, that reads just like history, even though it was prophetic about what Jesus would come to do. We can read about in the tabernacle. We can read about the Passover and how they point to Jesus. We can read in our Bibles, Leviticus 16, the Day of Atonement, and then go to the book of Hebrews and see how all this comes together. Isn't that precious truth? Because let me tell you, friend, there are prophecies in the Old Testament that have not yet been fulfilled, but will be. There are still prophecies in the Old Testament that will be fulfilled literally when Jesus Christ comes back. For example, Isaiah 60 to 66, talking about the millennial, the, the kingdom, the, the age. In many passages in the Minor Prophets, talking about the day of the Lord. Those are all pointing forward. So don't neglect the Old Testament. Don't say, I don't need to read those first 39 books anymore. But read and saying, Lord, open my eyes to see Jesus all the way through. Because Jesus, he explained to these men, he was teaching them from the scriptures. He began with Moses and ended up in the prophets about how Jesus had to die on the cross. He got the Psalm 16 that you will not allow your Holy One to see corruption. The glorious resurrection. So we see what Jesus is doing. Now we see the comfort of the disciples being in verse 28, the companionship of Christ. And they approached the village where they were going, and he acted as though he were going to go farther. But they urged him, saying, Stay with us, for it's getting toward evening, and the day is now nearly over. So he went in to stay with them. And when he had reclined at the table with them, he took the bread and blessed it, and breaking it, he began giving it to them. He's went in, but he takes the bread. He blesses it, and he breaks it, and he's giving it to them. Dr. David Jeremiah wrote, as the men drew near their destination, Christ did not force himself into their home. Notice that. Jesus didn't force himself in. They compelled, they urged him to come and join them. He waited until they invited him in, and then he became a crucial part of their lives. Would you look at one verse with me in Revelation chapter 3 and verse 20? What Jesus said, as Jesus wrote this letter to the church of Laodicea, the lukewarm church. At one time they had a zeal, at one time they were hot, but now they're lukewarm. The Laodiceans understood lukewarmness. They had a water problem. Laodicea was a very wealthy commercial city, a major business place. They were known for their banking, they were known for their ISAB, they were known for all this industry, very wealthy. But they had a major problem. They didn't have good water. 
So what they had to do was pipe in the water from both Colossae and Hierapolis, miles away. Well, one of those cities had the hot springs. But guess what? By the time it traveled the miles in the aqueduct and to getting into Laodicea, what happened to that water? It was no longer hot. And the other city had the cold springs. And, and it would be piped in to Laodicea. But again, even though it started out cold, by the time it gets to Laodicea, guess what temperature it is? It's lukewarm. So when Jesus talks to them in Laodicea about lukewarmness, they know exactly what he's talking about. They experience it all the time. They have bad water. And even the water that comes in from the springs is now lukewarm. And Jesus has said to them that you are like your water. You're lukewarm. You don't have that zeal for me. I would wish that you were either cold or hot, but you are lukewarm, and because you're lukewarm, I will vomit you out of my mouth. But in verse 20, Jesus is outside the church. He's outside his own church. In verse 20, he says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. Jesus is outside the door, knocking. If anyone, now notice that, Singular. If there's anyone inside there who hears me knocking, hears my voice and opens the door. Is Jesus forcing the door open? Does he have the power to? Yeah. But he's not forcing it open, is he? He says, if anyone in there hears my voice, I'm there knocking. If anyone opens the door, what happens? I will come into him and will dine with him. Friend, eating together, eating in the scriptures is a picture of fellowship. We'll dine with him and he with me. Wow. Jesus said, is, if there's anybody in there, that hears me and opens the door. I'm not going to force it open. But you have the choice. They've compelled, they've urged Jesus to come in and eat. And Jesus breaks the bread. The companionship of Jesus Christ. The completed work of Christ we see in Luke 24 verses 31 and 32. Then their eyes were opened and they recognized him. And he vanished from their sight. Now they're allowed to know who he is. They recognize Jesus and he vanishes from their sight. They said to one another, were not our hearts burning within us while he was speaking to us on the road, while he was explaining the scriptures to us? What were burning? Our hearts. When we heard him explaining the scriptures to us, and who were these scriptures talking about? Jesus. Friend, it's all about Jesus. I believe with all my heart the overarching theme of the scriptures from Genesis to Revelation is Jesus, the Lamb of God, our Redeemer. How he would come. How he died on the cross. How he rose again. How he ascended. How he is seated at the right hand of the Father, making intercession for us. How he's coming back. How he's going to rule as King of kings and Lord of lords. It's all about Jesus, amen? From Genesis to Revelation. Their hearts burned within them as Jesus explained the scriptures to them. 
We look at this and say, well, if I could have just been there and had Jesus explain the scriptures. But here's the reality that we have today. The reality is what a wonderful Bible study and we would have loved to have been there with, been with Jesus then. But we have the same Old Testament. We have the Holy Spirit to teach us so we too can discover in all the scriptures the things concerning Jesus. A great point by Dr. William MacDonald. We have the same opportunity, don't we? Because Jesus said, it's to your advantage that I go away. Because if I go away, I will send the comforter, comforter to you. And he will not only be with you, he will be in you. The precious Holy Spirit who guides us into all truth. Who teaches us the word. Who opens up to us the scriptures. Have you ever read a familiar scripture and said, I saw something new there I never saw before? Who was working? The Holy Spirit showing you. Open your eyes to a truth in God's word. I love it when that happens. I celebrate when that happens. <laughs> Thank you, Lord. Thank you. I've always heard pastors say it's a dangerous to, to preach a familiar text. For example, David and Goliath or, or various things because a lot of times people will tune out. I, I already know that story. I've heard it a million times. But they miss the opportunity that God's going to teach them something new from that familiar text that they never learned before, never saw. You may be going through something in your life and, and you read that passage, you read a psalm, or you read something in the scriptures, and it hits you like it's never hit you before. I had that with a hymn years ago. Rachel was in the intensive care unit after birth. Lisa and I had went home to get new clothes and were on the way back to children's. Lisa was exhausted, she's asleep, and I have the uh, WEEC from Springfield on, the, the radio station, and I'm driving in Columbus, and I'm hearing... A mighty fortress is our God. I'd heard that hymn a ton of times. But guess what? That day as I'm driving, I'm hearing a mighty fortress is our God. The tears are coming from my eyes. And I'm praising the Lord and I'm thanking so much. You're my mighty fortress. That hymn took a new meaning that day, friend. And whenever I hear that hymn now, <laughs> I think about that day. Thank you, Lord. That him at that moment expressing praise to you that you're my mighty fortress, my mighty God. The completed work of Christ. Verses 31 and 32, their eyes opened. He vanished from their sight. They said to one another, were not our hearts burning within us while he was speaking to us on the road, while he was explaining the scriptures to us? Convinced they must tell others. They're like, we can't keep this to ourselves. What must we do? They have never ran back to Jerusalem so fast in their lives. They're seven miles away in Emmaus, but they're going to get back to Jerusalem. Why? They've got news to tell. <laughs> we have seen the risen Christ. He explained to us the scriptures on the way. Let us tell you what happened. Verses 33 to 35, and they got up that very hour and returned to Jerusalem and found gathered together the eleven and those who were with them. Now there's, the eleven are saying, the Lord has really risen. He's appeared to Simon. We're told that in 1 Corinthians 15, 5. I have it on your notes. For I delivered to you as of the first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures. And that he was buried, and that he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures. And that he appeared to Cephas, then to the twelve. That's Peter. He's appeared to Peter. He's going to appear to all of the ones. Well, Thomas misses that, and then later on he's going to be there. They began to relate their experiences on the road, and how he was recognized by them in the breaking of bread. 
Another statement by Adrian Rogers, you might as well have told the sun not to shine as to tell these people not to witness about a risen Savior. We've got to tell others. Friend, I want to encourage you to remember uh, there's an important statement that summarizes a lot of Scripture. Come and see. Go and tell. What did the Samaritan woman do? Come and see. She talked with Jesus at the well, John 4. But what's she do? She runs and goes and tells them in the village, there's a man here who's told me all that I've ever done. Could it be the Christ? And here's that village. Many get saved. They said it wasn't no longer because what you said, but we heard Jesus ourselves. But they would have never came without the woman going and saying, a lot of times we make it a lot harder than it really is. Witnessing it really comes down to this. Come and see. Go and tell. What is the Lord doing for you? What's your testimony? It don't have to be long. In fact, it's better when it's not really long. I always think about it this way, B.C., before Christ. A.C., at conversion. In C is currently before Christ, coming to know Jesus, and then now. Don't leave out the now. What's the Lord doing now? Some of you have been walking with the Lord 50 or 60 years. Don't leave that out. I've known the Lord. I've been walking with Him, and He's never left me. I've had tough times, but He's never left me. He's been right there with me. And this is what the Lord's doing. You know what it is? Come and see. Go and tell. You know this verse? Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. I like to go to Costco when they have those people giving samples out. But you know what the problem is? It's just a little taste. And you know what they're trying to tell you? This is the taste. Isn't that good? This last week, I got a hold of something that was terrible. I mean, it was awful. And the, it was kind of funny because the one that was giving out the sample said, it's interesting, isn't it? <laughs> she really wasn't selling the product too well, but she's right. I said, oh, that's awful. You should serve something to drink to get this taste out. But we can say with the Lord... I've experienced and it's good. <laughs> and I want more. I want more in that relationship. Those guys on the way to Emmaus <laughs> had a Bible study with Jesus. But what I love is, you know who initiated it all? Jesus said, what are you guys talking about? What things? <laughs> What's been happening? He asked those questions. And then Jesus explained the scriptures to them. And their hearts burned within them. And then they saw that he's the risen Christ. And he came back and said, those women were right. <laughs> Everything they said is true. Jesus is risen just like he said. He is Lord. Bow your heads, please. Father, we thank you for this scripture. We're amazed that Jesus explained the gospel himself. He explained the scriptures. He explained how those scriptures were pointing to him and what he came to do. And their hearts burned within them. Lord, if we know you as our Lord and Savior, but we don't have that hunger... We don't have that burning in our hearts. We're not experiencing that growing, that vitality in our relationship with you. The problem's not with you. You never have moved. If we're not as close with you as we once were. Maybe there's somebody here today that's just like the Laodicean church, lukewarm. They used to have a zeal. They used to have a fire. They used to be hot. But now there's a lukewarmness. 
Would you set their hearts afire? Would you revive them? That they would recognize their sin and confess that to you? That lukewarmness is actually a sin. It was not honorable, pleasing to you. Maybe there's somebody here that's not saved, and we would ask even today, as they've heard the gospel, that they would respond to you and be saved, to believe in you, Lord Jesus. Have your way in this invitation. Oh, we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Would you please stand?